And want to welcome those that are joining us online. We've got Isaiah Saldivar. Saldivar, not salad bar. There you go. Not Saldivar. It's Saldivar with us. We're located in Birmingham, Alabama, uh, here at a deliverance workshop. We're going to be doing some Q&A, and um, thank you so much for being with us. Isaiah, we're going to start with a question on children, children in deliverance. And you hit this a little bit. And um, can you speak specifically about deliverance for children? What to do? especially if parents are not believers, aren't open to the idea of deliverance. What are some, what are some tips? So when we see in scripture, there's seven deliverances that we see Jesus did in the Bible. At the end of John, John says, if everything Jesus did was recorded, perhaps the world would not be able to contain it. So we know that Jesus obviously did more than seven deliverances. We just have seven at our disposal. Two out of the seven are children. So deliverance in the, there is children's deliverance in the Bible. On both occasions, it was the parents bringing their kids. So it was the faith of the parents parents on behalf of the children. So I would say it's incredibly essential that the parents have faith to believe for their kids to be delivered. And also, because I've had family bring kids that their parents are very, not just abusive, but a toxic environment. And I, I at one kid, I, I felt like the Lord told me, don't do deliverance on them because they're going to go back into that environment and get re-demonized even worse. So I knew they were going back into an abusive situation. So my, my um, conversation with her grandmother wasn't, hey, let's get deliverance. It was, hey, how do we get them out of this environment that's abusive, which is a whole nother legal discussion that's not about deliverance. But I just felt very worried that if we do deliverance on her, she goes back to that abusive uh, drug addict, alcoholism, all that in her house, the demons would come back worse. Second of all, I recognize that demons, demons honor spiritual authority. So as parents, I don't know what age does this end. It probably depends on the kid. But demons recognize that you are a spiritual, uh, you are a spiritual guardian of your home and you are a spiritual guardian of your kids. So as a father, you have more authority over your kids than your wife. If you look at statistics, they say like if the dad goes to church, the statistics are like the 80 percentile, their kids will go to church. If the mom just goes to church, it's like less than whatever, 5%, some crazy statistic. The point is the father has more authority in the household than the mom and the same regards, it goes into children's deliverance. So number one, I tell people, before your kids get delivered, you get delivered. That's so important because some of these spirits are ancestral. They're tied into your ancestry. They're generational. And what you'll find is when you're doing deliverance on the kid, it's often tied to the deliverance of the parents or what the parents have invited into the home. That's there was good. a guy that I've shared a story with and his daughter was, I don't know, four or five, six years old, something like that. And he shares a story about how she was coming up to him one day saying all these sexual things. I won't say because there's kids in the room, but his daughter should not know any of this. And his friends were coming over and she was saying crazy stuff to his friends. And he went to this guy, this pastor, like, I don't know what to do about my daughter. She's saying all these crazy perverted things all of a sudden. And the pastor had a vision of him watching pornography in his office, his home office. And he said, have you been watching pornography? And he turned white as a ghost, crying, yes, I have. And he said, the Lord's showing me you opened a portal in your house and a spirit of lust came through your screen and jumped on your daughter. You need to go through deliverance and then she will be delivered. He got deliverance right there and his daughter never said another word, never needed deliverance. And so, so yes, there could be... Yeah, it's not always the case, but you can get breakthrough in your kids if you get delivered. And then also I say, if it's good enough for you, if it's good enough for them, it should be good enough for you. I take it as this, and this is the last thing I'll say on this question is, when you're doing kids deliverance, I don't take them through unforgiveness. I don't take them through renouncing. I just command the demon to leave. I deal with them as they are there, as they understand in their own terms. I'll explain to them, hey, you're a home and demons call you their home and we're gonna get those demons out of your house. And oftentimes the demons come out of the front door, which is your mouth. So you might feel like something come out of your mouth. You might feel like screaming, that's okay. And I'll explain to them very simple. I learned that method by Frank Hammond, right? If, you, if you're taking notes, has a book called Children's Deliverance. If you get on Amazon where he teaches what age, how to do deliverance on kids, very effective book. I don't need to rewrite the book. He's already written it and he has great material. But yeah, I would deal with it differently. I would just say I'm their spiritual authority. I'm their covering and I'm going to take authority over these unclean spirits um, because God's given me spiritual authority over them. That's really good. Um, particularly around the, un, you know, parents aren't believers. Um, one thing I would advise you, if you have friends and you have friends who have children and their children are really struggling, 
You know, there's power in the testimony. So they may not come to church, but what you can say is, hey, I know people and we have seen success yes. in setting children free. Hey, and the good news is they don't even have to come to church. Good. I think the days need to be over where we have to get people in church. You know, their, their entry door to the church may be a deliverance yes. session with their kid. 100%. And so go pray over their kid and, and offer to do that or call upon people in your church who are doing that. Um, I think it's I think it's a good thing to share stories of how because every parent wants their kid yes. to be free, yes. and yes. they're they're really willing to do anything to see their child. And I have seen parents, as you just said, come to the Lord because their kid. We were just sharing a story in the back about a friend of ours that, but they'll come to the Lord, seeing their kid tormented. It'll be a gateway for them to seek deliverance, which is what is, what is seeking deliverance is seeking Christ. So as you seek Christ, and as they're looking for God for their kids, they get wrapped up in the fires of revival, and they end up getting saved and coming to church. So it's a great vehicle for them to be saved. Come on. All right. I want to stay on that vein for just a second. A couple of kid questions. Um, and there's different opinions on the topic of autism. Yes. And this person says, you know, I work with children uh, who are autistic. Can you speak about this in times where you have seen success with deliverance in autism, if you've seen deliverance in autism. We're going straight for the controversial yeah. ones. Yeah, I can't wait but, for all the clips again, on YouTube. And you know, you know, I'll clarify this. Let's there go. are there are different ways to attack different things that are going yes. on. Yes. And this person is saying, I'm, I'm mindful that it's not always yes. demonic, yes. but have there been times where you've seen success with this? 100%. I'll share a story that's super close to home about autism. I know a lot of my friends don't believe autism is ever demonic. Here's what I believe when it comes to mental health. If you go to a doctor, they cannot diagnose spiritual issues and they'll often misdiagnose you, period. So for example, the key definition of schizophrenia, one of the key trademarks of a doctor diagnosing you as schizophrenic with medication is you hear voices. Voices, okay, so you go to the doctor and say I'm hearing a voice telling me to kill myself The doctor is gonna look, get through his book of mental illnesses, which is like thousands and say oh that la that's labeled as schizophrenia The doctor is not gonna say go to deliverance at your local church He's gonna say here's medicine for schizophrenia now that for me would not be schizophrenia That would be you have a demon you need deliverance So what happened? There's a misdiagnosis because the diagnosis is you need deliverance the doctor can only do so much and I love doctors My cousin's a doctor my other cousin's a nurse, so I believe in it But they do what they're called to do we do what we're called to do so there's a there But there is a lot of crossover So if you see where they brought the sick to Jesus the Bible said he healed the sick and cast their demons So it's not this or that it's and and both so it's we need both of them We need the medical realm and we need the stuff the doctors do but we also need the deliverance when it comes to autism Here's why it's so hard to distinguish whether it's a demon or not. There's a, if you know anything about autism, there's a spectrum. Some people are severely autistic. Some people are not hardly autistic at all. So I can't say autism is a demon or it's not a demon because it's, it's dynamic. There's so many variables. Now, let me give you my testimony. My little sister has two amazing children. She's pregnant with her third. We have nobody in our family that's autistic. As of now, we do with my, do my sister having two kids that are both diagnosed autistic. So now we're learning as a family about autism. And I'm watching videos, I'm reading books because we want to be equipped to help her with her kids who are, now they're verbal, but they were nonverbal for a long time. So we're trying to work it through that she has hours a day of therapy and speech therapy and all that. I say all that to say, my sister was on fire for many years, kind of lost her fire for a year or two, got relit on fire about maybe a year and a half ago and was like, I want to pray for my son who's nonverbal, barely talks, and I want to pray for deliverance because I feel like, as, her, as the mother, she said, I feel like there's demonic stuff going on with my son. This is not normal, the stuff he's doing. So I went over there, and again, he barely says anything. He, he doesn't talk much at the time, and we did full-blown deliverance on him. We started praying for him. Doctors have already labeled him as autistic, and I'll tell you right now, for not, without spending 30 minutes going into the whole story, he manifested a bunch of demons, right? He was talking clearly. The demons were talking out of him. He was like, leave me alone. I don't want you here. Go home. Why are you here? Which he had never said any of those words before, and now he's telling me those words, you know, his favorite uncle, shout out. And so he's now saying all these things that he should not know about. He shouldn't be able to say. He's speaking when he wasn't really verbal before and he got so much relief started talking right after started saying words We saw dramatic uh, Improvement dramatic improvement that only God can do and my sister was like yeah He got delivered God set him free from all these spirits that were keeping him mute and not able to speak with all that being said He's talking now. He's verbal. He's saying all this stuff. But let me say this It wasn't just the deliverance because the deliverance was tremendous help but he also, as well, 
has a speech therapist now. My sister said, we're not just going to get him deliverance. We're also going to get him a therapist to help him continue to develop his vocabulary. And so now he's gotten deliverance, tremendously better. Demons came out of him. No one could tell me otherwise. But he's also going through what they tell you to do as autism and getting speech therapy. So I don't think it's one or the other. I don't think if your kid's autistic, it's like, it's a demon. Don't go to the doctor. Don't go to therapist. Don't get any help. Don't get speech therapy. I think go through deliverance because it doesn't hurt. And then also let's see what the doctors have to say. And let's walk through the process of whatever part of the spectrum they are. Because one of the worst things we can be as parents is in denial because we're so spiritual, right? Like there's kids that die of sickness because their parents are like, well, I'm just gonna keep getting to lay hands. Yeah, that's great. Let's lay hands and pray. But if God, for whatever reason, doesn't heal them or for whatever reason, they don't get healed, let's also seek medical attention. Don't let your kid die because you keep bringing them to church and they have cancer and they need to go through some type of chemo or radiation. So I know some of you won't agree. That's where I'm at. I think both are important. Let's just end with this. Luke, the most supernatural book in the Bible is the book of Acts. And the one who wrote the book of Acts was a medical doctor. So yeah. I think there's room for both. Awesome. I like that. I like that. And one, one word I like to use uh, is spiritual therapy. Yes. Spiritual therapy. Let's get people spiritual help. Uh, we have no problem going to get physical help. Um, but if you're a Christian, you should attack an issue from every angle, yes, in yes. my opinion. If you're diagnosed with stage four cancer, um, it's an aggressive form of a cancer, and I think it justifies aggressive treatment, yes. which includes sometimes things like chemo, but also prayer yes. and fasting and all sorts of things. So when it comes to our children, hit it from every angle. Yep. I think it's a really healthy thing to do. 100%. All right, let's transition uh, into the category of new age things, all right? And so let's look at this question that came from someone that says, hey, inner healing seems to be a term that's also used with new age practice in other areas. Well, talk, talk into inner healing and how it plays a part in deliverance. I'll say anything that you're using to heal you other than God is, is not is demonic. There's only the Holy Spirit and there's demonic spirits. So if you're using demonic practices, you can call them whatever you want. I've had this debate with family members many times like, oh, I'm just using Reiki. It's not bad. It is bad because you're not using the Holy Spirit. You're circumventing the Holy Spirit and you're now going to a different spirit to facilitate your healing. So the whole new age deception in a nutshell is basically putting a band-aid on a gunshot wound and trying to use these methods and practices that are all from unclean spirits to solve issues that only God can solve. And it's a lot of light, it's a lot of wholeness, it's a lot of health, but it's all deception. It's, it's repackaged. The Bible says that the devil comes as an angel of light so isn't it clear that also his, his apostles also come as angels of light, which is false prophets? So the New Age deception is a, a deception of light and healing and yoga, which is completely Hindu and demonic. And all of these practices, they all have pagan Hindu roots. A lot of them do, Eastern Hindu roots. And a lot of them are, majority of them pagan. A lot of them are cult-like. And they all stem from different spirits than the Holy Spirit. Jesus claimed this, I am the only way. There's no other way. Muhammad, Buddha, a lot of them believe Jesus is a way, but he's not the way. And in the Christian faith, Jesus is not a way to God. He is the way to God. So if there's any other way, it's not God. It has to be labeled as demonic. And that includes a lot of like the Reiki healing, the light healing, the crystal healing, the tarot cards, all the new age spirituality, you know, the law of attraction, all of that is under the umbrella of pagan occultism, which is new age. And that falls in like Buddhism and Hinduism and Shintoism and all that stuff. It's all demonic. It's all ungodly. None of it's right. If it's not in scripture, we should not be doing it as believers. And if you do things that aren't in scripture, that aren't godly, then you're opening yourself up to demonic spirits. And I tell people, why would you go to that when you could just go to God? God. He won't even charge you. It's free. And you're paying all this money. I got to have a pendulum on my forehead. I'm like, bro, put slap some anointing oil. It's way cheaper getting some extra virgin olive oil than a, a crystal pendulum. So to me, why go to the crystal when you can go to the God that created the crystal, right? And we see in scripture, God forbids witchcraft. God forbids charms and crystals and soothsayers and all that. And it's in the Bible. If you go read the book of Ezekiel, witches wore crystals. And the Bible says that they were attacking the people of God and the Lord condemned them to death. So don't get involved than any of it. Um, it it's claims to be good, but it's another deception to get people involved in it. Yeah. Inner healing um, is, is often a word that's used by the church too. Um, so just get clarification because yes. that, that word is used in occultic practices. But when the church uses that word and they're using it correctly and biblically, it's just referring to healing of the soul, yes. which demons often attack the soul. We want to see a person healed in the soul 
Um, but, but one way to get around that if you're thinking about a deliverance ministry is, you know, if you're going to use the word inner healing, tag it with deliverance or just call it deliverance. Yeah, yeah. Just call it deliverance. Um, I, I think that the church, by and large, has been scared of that word deliverance because you might get labeled by people. But, but you know, people are looking for deliverance yes. is what I found. So good. And so just go ahead and use the word. Jesus used the word. We shouldn't be scared to use the word. Yep. I think when we say deliverance, we often think people are going to think about that movie. Um, but, you know, hey, listen, it was a long time ago. We're good. Just use the and word deliverance. And then if you want to know if, it's, if what your friend is doing inner healing, like I have family members like, yeah, I'm doing Reiki, I'm doing this. I just ask them, okay, whoever's doing this practice on you of inner healing, ask them what their source is. That's like a very new age word that every new ager understands because they teach source energy. And That's if their good. source is not the Holy Ghost, it's the wrong source. So just say, oh, you're doing inner healing. Ask the person doing inner healing on you, what is their source? Where is their origin of power? And if they say the origin of power is anything other than the Holy Spirit or Jesus, Red flag, it's demonic. So yeah. that's a good thing yeah, to ask. Was, is just what's the source? I was doing a conference at a denominational church, and I'm walking down their hallway to the worship center, and they have a Reiki healing event for that Saturday morning. And I was uh, like, well, I think I know like what I'm going to talk yoga. about tonight. <laughs> Uh, so there's a lot of people in deception. Yeah, yeah, there's there's yeah. people who have messianic lodges that meet in their church. I mean, there's just a lot of people that, like the Apostle Paul writes to the church of Corinth, did you not know? Yes. Did you not know? And they don't. So, and I guarantee there's tons of churches in this city that have yoga meetings at the church and Christian yoga, yeah. which if you don't know what yoga means, it means to unite with the Brahmin, which is the Hindu version of God. So if you want to unite yourself with false gods, then go do yoga. But it's just insane that it's happening in the churches. Hallelujah. All right. Um, let's see. I had a question. There's so many. Okay. When, when someone is uh, discerning what's going on in their life, can you talk a little bit about discerning the difference between a, a battle with the flesh and a battle with a demon? And yeah. how can you tell? Yeah, super simple. So we know the flesh is our unrepentant fallen nature that everyone has. And even as Christians, we have to what? Crucify the flesh. So the flesh doesn't automatically disappear. Paul said, I die daily to the flesh. So we're always crucifying the sinful nature. The flesh and a demon are not the same thing, although they work together. Well, I would say it better. A demon works with the flesh. Um, here's a really good indicator on how to tell the difference. The flesh doesn't speak to you. Okay? Your flesh is your own sinful nature that craves sinful things, but it doesn't talk. It doesn't tell you cut your arm. It doesn't give you these crazy perverted desires. So a telltale sign that you have a demon and it's not just your flesh is if you're hearing a voice or you're getting dominating thoughts that you don't want. So for me, when I got deliverance, I knew I needed deliverance because I was eating breakfast and I was getting the most bizarre, tormenting, twisted, perverted thoughts. And I'm like, these thoughts are not mine. I've never even looked at a thing like that or thought of that. And these were like twisted, twisted thoughts. I won't even say on the mic. And I knew that's a demon, right? So that's another thing. Also, if you're getting perverted things that are not natural. So for example, if you are a male, you should be, praise God, naturally attracted to females. That's how God designed you. Even your flesh would be naturally designed to desire women. And even, even in a lustful way, the flesh would desire women. If you're having desires towards men and you're a male, that is not your flesh. That is a demonic spirit or a spirit of perversion. And the Bible says God handed them over to their own perversions because it was beyond what the Bible would call iniquity. Iniquity is perverted sin. So it's one thing to be insane. It's another thing to be in iniquity, which is sin, which has been perverted. So that's another telltale sign. When you're having these overly demonic um, thoughts or dominating thoughts, if you're hearing voices, it's usually not the flesh. The flesh must be crucified, but demons must be cast out. You can't cast out the flesh and you can't crucify a demon. So you need to know what is what. And the flesh is, the way we crucify it is through fasting, is through prayer, is through being renewed in our mind by the word of God. But you can fast all you want. You can pray all you want. You can renew your mind all you want. If you have a demon, you need to go through a deliverance. It's the way Jesus prescribed it. It's what Jesus taught. Jesus did not say, just keep fasting and it'll leave you. Jesus did not say, just keep praying and it'll leave you. Jesus said, this type of spirit only comes out by prayer and fasting. Meaning if you have a lifestyle prayer and fasting, it'll give you authority to cast out that level of demon. So that's another story. But I would say the number one telltale sign is the voices. If you're hearing something in your head or you're getting thoughts that aren't yours, it's likely a demonic spirit and not your flesh. But sometimes it's hard to tell because they inter, they cross over, they're in a kind of interlinear. So the demons will exaggerate the flesh, they'll play on the flesh, and they'll utilize the flesh to their own advantage. And sometimes it is hard to tell. That's where you just need to ask the Lord. And, and then I tell people, just go through deliverance, even if it's not a demon. 
did. At least you go through deliverance and you realize there's nothing there. Deliverance, guys, let's be honest, is just prayer. That's all it is. So people are like, oh, I don't want to go through deliverance. I'm scared. Just prayer. It's, I'll go through deliverance right now on the stage. I don't care. I'll, I'll make sure nothing's there. It's just, it's not some spooky thing. It's just getting prayer. And I, I don't ever turn down prayer. I'm like, hey, pray, let's go. So I would say we need to demystify like the deliverance thing and realize it's just getting prayer. That's good. That's good. Uh, can you speak a little bit into the importance of discipline following deliverance? Uh, one of the things that you mentioned was, um, you know, you get free, but talk about um, some of the issues that we see with sometimes people, especially in charismatic world, they want, they want a quick, yep. they want a quick answer. And then they go back to doing the same things that they were doing. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of discipline and maybe even what Jesus said about how to treat your body and what Paul says about how to discipline yourself yeah. so that you don't get disqualified, but also so that you don't get into deeper issues. Uh, just talk about discipline a little bit. Yeah, so I have a whole teaching on how to keep demons out. And then one of those points of that teaching, and it's also in the, the book I have coming out in November, is making sure the doors they came through don't get reopened. So when you're slamming a door closed, everybody has a different battle. Everyone's dealing with something different. So when you're slamming a door closed, if I know that I had a spirit of lust and that's what, the way the demon got in, then I need to be over vigilant to make sure that lust doesn't come back. And that might mean literally getting delivered and then going home and saying, guess what? Which I don't know who keeps calling me. My phone's blowing up. I'm like, stop calling me. It's probably a telemarketer. But that might mean that this, I have an under disturb now. That might mean that that and me don't stay in the same room. So I know one guy does a lust and the way he got free was he got deliverance. And then he said, I am not gonna leave my, my phone or any electronic device in my bedroom at night. Cause I already know I'm gonna be up late at night on my phone and that's how I fall into lust. So he never puts his phone or any electric device in his bedroom. He's like, my bedroom's a holy place. That's where I sleep. And that's what kept him from getting those demons back. Jesus said this, if your eye caused you to sin, yes, even your good eye, then gouge it out. Cause it's better to enter heaven with one eye than hell with two eyes. If your hand, even your good hand, if you're right-handed, your right hand cause you to sin, cut it off. So the point of the story is sometimes you have to be drastic to discipline your body so you don't go back to the sins that you know so easily beset you. If you're in this room and you're a drug addict, I never did drugs. I was going into law enforcement. You're not allowed to have dr do drugs. So I would never be tempted. You could put a mountain of cocaine in front of me and I, you couldn't pay me a billion dollars to snort it. Yet for some of you, that's what triggers you. You know, if you go to that old trap house, those old friends, you're bored, you're going to go back and find that same contact. So guess what you might need to do? Get delivered from the spirit of addiction and then delete every contact from every one of your old drug dealers. That might be what you, you have to remove every option, close every door, burn every bridge so that you give the devil a hard time to enter back into you. Don't be so easy for the devil. I got to deal with guys and I'm like, bro, you're just so easy. You have a computer right there in your bedroom. You're up late at night. Like you're out at midnight with a girl when you shouldn't be. You're making it easy. You're not falling into it. You're opening the door. So discipline is a thousand percent essential. Some people don't need deliverance. They need discipline. And when you start seeing the discipline in your life, some of you will realize, oh, I've been blaming the devil for my own issues. It's actually not the demon. It's actually that I don't exercise. I don't sleep right. I don't eat right. I'm filling my body with junk food. I'm staying up all late to the hours of the night. I'm flirting with all these people at work. And it's not even a demon. The devil's like, I'm chilling in Hawaii. You're doing the work yourself. So <laughs> I think sometimes we have to realize that we need discipline, not even necessarily deliverance, but then after deliverance even, we need to discipline ourselves so that the, the demons don't seek re-entrance and don't come back. I can't overstate how important it is to take practical steps to get rid of anything in your life, Hebrews talks about it, that hinders you. If it's Instagram, and, and here's the thing, every single one of you know what your trigger is. Every single one of you know what opens the door. Every single, no one's ignorant. We all know what stirs that lust up in us. So if it's Instagram, get rid of Instagram. If it's TikTok, get rid of TikTok. You don't need to be scrolling anyway. You got better things to do than being watching young people dance in bikinis. I mean, you shouldn't be on there. It's completely dark. It's completely twisted. And uh, get some discipline in your life and get rid of things that are causing you to stumble and reopening the doors. Amen. That's a good word. Uh, talk a little bit about, we had a question about, um, you know, we're commanded to cast demons out in Jesus' name. How specific should we be with Jesus' name? Should it be Jesus Christ of Nazareth? Should it be Yeshua? 
Uh, how do we know we're not talking, um, you know, so, so talk a little bit about so just the, the, the general beauty, understanding. Yeah, the beauty of the Christian faith is it's not a legalistic faith. So like the Quran has to be in its original language. If you translate the Quran into English, it's not considered holy anymore. Unlike the Bible where the Bible is written in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, and when we translate to English, it still has the same power because we're not living by this legalistic, ritualistic type thing. And it's the same thing with baptism. People are like, if you didn't get baptized in the name of Jesus and you got baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it's not the same. Well, the Bible says baptism baptized in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then it also says baptize in Jesus' name. And the reason why is they're all the same. It doesn't matter. God is not up there like, you forgot to say. So when I baptize, I say in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and in the name of Jesus. Because I'm like, we'll just make sure you got it right. So the point is, though, God is not as legalistic as we are with terms and words. And I'll tell you, seeing thousands of people getting delivered, I have never once had a demon say, I'm not responding till you say it in Hebrew. <laughs> so I'm literally like, I have had... You know, demons hate the Bible. I didn't teach on this earlier, but it's a weapon of warfare. So in deliverance, if you put a Bible up to somebody manifesting, a lot of times the demon will scream being like, I hate that because to them it's a sword. In the, in the spirit realm, the Bible is a sword. And some people go really deep into that, but that's another story. I'm just letting you know they see the Bible as a spiritual sword and as a weapon and they hate it. I've had a New Living Translation Bible. I've had an ESV Bible. I've had a New King James. And guess what? The demons all screamed and they hated them all equally. They did not care if it was NLT, ESV, or NIV. I know some of you hate the NIV. They didn't care. They were like, get that Bible away from me. We hate it because it's God's word, but it's not in a legalistic sense where it has to be Yeshua or I, I like to say Jesus of Nazareth because I'm like, let's just remember where he's from and the demons hate it because they remember seeing him in Nazareth. But you could say whatever. It's just in Jesus' name. And even if you say like, I command you, you out in Jesus' name, and then you say, come out, come out. The demon's not going to be like, well, you didn't say in Jesus' name every time, so we don't want to be too ritualistic or religious. I will share a funny story. One time, it was 2 o'clock in the morning when I had first gotten saved. My mom is a sheriff. She works in the sheriff's department, and I was living with her still. I'd just gotten saved, and she was in her room sleeping. She had to get up super early for work, and I was in the living room with some of my party friends. Well, they were party friends. They're all saved now, and we were casting a demon out of this girl, one of our other friends, and we were screaming for hours, and my mom woke up in the middle of the night and yells down the hallway, you need to use the name of Jesus. Us more. So I'm like, oh, you're right. We, because we were so caught up, we just weren't using the name of Jesus, right? Because it's two in the morning and we just, we were just saying, come out, come out. And my mom's like, trying to wake up and get up for work and she hears us screaming and goes like, oh, they're not using the name of Jesus. So then we start saying, in Jesus' name, and the demon, the demon listened. But yeah, funny story about normal occurrence over at my house. Like, use the name of Jesus more. Use the name of Jesus. Yeah, middle of the night. Poor That's mom. Hilarious. Sorry, mom. All those nights you didn't sleep. Hey, let's talk a little bit about self-deliverance. Um, do you believe that self-deliverance is possible? Um, also, are there times where self-deliverance is not effective and you need to go to a brother and sister? Talk about instances maybe in both. Yeah, okay, so self-deliverance works, but it's not necessarily biblical. And we know just because something's not in the Bible doesn't mean it's not godly, because, of course, tons of stuff is not in the Bible, and the Bible even says that. So just because it's not in the Bible, as long as it's not anti-biblical, it's fine. And so there, we don't see an issue of self-deliverance. Jesus' method was believers casting out demons from other people. So that was the method the Bible teaches. Have I seen success in it in, in rare instances? But I would say most of the time it's not effective, and I'll tell you why. Especially in the case of heavy demonization is because you're trying to talk, and then the demon's trying to talk out of you. And you can only have one person, I don't know if you know this, unless you're Hispanic, you don't have one person at a time talking out of you. So you have to kind of choose. I recommend if you are going to do self-deliverance, there's a couple things. Only do it if there's no way to find someone to do deliverance on you, which we have a deliverance map, which we're revamping right now. But if you go to deliverancemap.com, we have thousands of people all over the world. We have people in every state, most cities that are doing deliverance. You have a church right here doing deliverance. So unless you really can't find somebody, I recommend first, before you try self-deliverance, look for somebody. And if you really can't, I personally believe that God will give you a special grace, just like he gives people dreams of him in tribes that are unreached and the Lord will show up in a dream. I think God will do special things for people that don't have the resources available to them. But I think you should first try to get deliverance through somebody else. If you're going to do self-deliverance, do it the same way you do normal deliverance. I recommend looking in a mirror because it's much easier when you're doing deliverance on yourself to command the demons that are living inside of you by looking at yourself and commanding them. Um, it is hard because the Bible talks about praying people through. You don't have no one to pray you through. It's hard to distinguish. Is it me? Is it the demon? It's hard if the demon starts choking you to talk. So there's a lot of reasons why it's hard. It's way more effective to do 
deliverance on people, but it does happen. And I know a guy specifically who's in my family, so I won't mention his name, who didn't want no one to pray deliverance over him, refused to be delivered even though he needed deliverance. And the only way he was gonna get delivered is if God did it and it was self-deliverance. And one night, very late at night, he started praying, Lord, if there's anything in me, because he was this guy will not let no one pray for him for deliverance. He's like, there's no way I have a demon. And uh, he was praying, Lord, you know, if there is, everyone's saying there is, if there is, deliver me. And the Lord straight up showed up that night in his bedroom, ripped every demon out of him. He got fully delivered and has never been the same. So that can happen, but don't be so stubborn like him. It's, it's just easier just to go get deliverance. It's, I would just go get deliverance. So yeah, it works and it happens, but it's not the biblical model and it's not nearly as effective as going through deliverance. And one thing I would add to that, if you've tried self-deliverance and you see no fruit, don't pretend like it's happened. Thank you. You know, if you, if you keep praying for yourself, but yet you keep looking at porn, yeah. then your deliverance has not worked. Yeah. And so, you know, the, the God created the body of Christ for yes. a reason. Yes. And uh, that's why we're commanded, if you are sick, if there are many amongst you sick, pray for self. No. Come on. Go and receive prayer. If you have a need, go for someone else. So the, all of the one another verses are there for a reason. Uh, I think it's not only so that we will uh, work with each other so that unity may be accomplished, but it's also for accountability purposes yep. in the area of deliverance. Confessing has great power yes. when it comes to deliverance. Yes. Telling someone often breaks the legal right of that demonic spirit. And so I would really, really encourage you. Uh, sometimes things break off with just repentance. Yep. Yep. If you just repent, they break off. Um, but some, most of the time, I would say, yeah having a brother or sister pray for you. That's so good. Sweet. Uh, how about um, deliverance for the unbeliever in especially evangelistic or pioneering settings when you're going into unreached people groups? And, uh, you know, we, we, we said earlier in the workshop, this primarily needs to be for believers yeah. or those that, that will work. place their trust in Jesus. But are there those occasions where God will use a miracle like deliverance to open the eyes of unbelievers. Yeah, I think so. If we see in Acts chapter eight, the Bible says Philip preached that he did what he taught and then he cast out demons and many sick were healed. I don't think that every single person that he probably prayed for right there in that moment was all sold out and born again, but they did respond to what he preached. And I think that was a moment in the Bible where the power of God was manifest and displayed, which brought people to salvation. So I think, yeah, I think people can receive some deliverance. I personally think, haven't seen a lot of fruit. I know a lot of friends that do street evangelism and I watch some of their stuff and see their videos. And what I've seen is a lot of times they're just riling up the demons and the demons are just screaming and manifesting. But I haven't personally, and I could be a thousand percent wrong. I'm not perfect. I don't know it all. I'm still learning. So I can be fully wrong on this, but I haven't seen a lot of fruit in just deliverance on unbelievers without presenting the gospel to them, right? So if you're on the corner, you're just praying for a guy that's addicted to drugs and there's many videos on YouTube like this and the guy's like, ah, screaming and then you just pray, manifest a bunch, and then you walk away onto the next guy. I personally haven't seen a lot of fruit in that. I think there needs to be a gospel presentation and these signs shall follow when there's that gospel presentation. It's what we see in scripture. Jesus would present the gospel, the disciples would present the gospel, and signs and wonders would confirm the word. If there's no word, what are the signs and wonders confirming? Because in the Bible, they confirmed his word. And if there's no word being proclaimed, there's, no, there's nothing the signs and wonders are pointing to. So I really think it's important there's a gospel proclamation. And I have no problem with going into unreached people groups, doing miracles and deliverance and presenting the gospel. I'm just more worried about guys that are going on YouTube making videos where they're praying for homeless people and the people are manifesting, but not getting freedom, not getting involved in a local church, not hearing the gospel, not having a chance to repent of their sins and turn to Christ. What benefit is it if I cast a demon out of you, but you still die and go to hell? I mean, maybe your life's a little bit less sufferable, but you still go to hell. My number one goal is that you know Christ and know him personally and have a relationship. The greatest miracle is to be born again and be saved, not deliverance. So to me, those things need to go hand in hand. So I would be leery about just doing deliverance in uh, settings like that without saying, hey, we wanna pray with you guys. We want you to be saved. If you wanna get delivered and saved, which they are the same word, come forward and there's a chance. And then the unbelievers come forward, they get deliverance, they get saved. It's a, it's, a, it's a three for one, healing, salvation, and deliverance. It's not just deliverance only. So I think if we do want unbelievers, there needs to be a gospel presentation there. And honestly too, it's like, it's really hard to do. It's hard to do deliverance on believers. I mean, some of you were up here last night, you're a believer and you were struggling to get free, let alone a guy who doesn't want God. I'm like, oh, I don't know. It's, it's tough to do it on the unbelievers. All right. I hope that brings some clarity. Yeah, I think that's really good. 
this question is centered around, um, uh, it, it just simply says, hey, I'm working through some things myself. I'm in a process of deliverance. I think that there's still some things going on. Should I be leery to lay hands on someone else and pray deliverance? Lots of controversial questions. Really good questions. Like, I love all of these. They're so thought out and so good. Um, the answer is you can still do deliverance. So I would say, and I'll tell you why I say this, there's a lot of people that are doing deliverance right now that don't even, that don't even know they need deliverance. And then a year goes by and then something surfaces and they're like, I didn't even know that was there and I've been doing deliverance for a year. So it doesn't disqualify you. Nowhere did Jesus tell the disciples, if you're not perfect, you can't go out and do deliverance. In fact, in the book of John, there was a group that weren't even with Jesus. They were casting out demons. And the disciples come up like, dude, these guys are over there casting demons. They're not even a part of our clique, our group, our church. Surely we should stop them. Here's Jesus says, Jesus says, don't stop them. Nobody that does miracles in my name will speak bad about me. Basically, Jesus says, if they're not against us and they're using my name and they're for us, let them do what they want to do. He didn't say, have they walked holiness? Do they go through our program? Do they do the 12 steps? Did they apply to become a disciple or are they apostle? No, he's like, bro, they're casting out demons in my name. They're doing great stuff, miracles they're doing. Let them be, leave them alone. So if somebody's doing miracles in the name and deliverance and doesn't know that they need deliverance, the demon in you cannot stop the authority Christ has given you. Just like if you have a demon, it doesn't mean you're not saved. You can have a demon and still go to heaven, right? Because it's not about what the demon's done, it's about what Christ has already done on the cross. Your authority, news alert, is not about you. The authority of, it's not about Isaiah or what I've done, it's about what Christ has done. He's conferred his authority upon thee. That is what the power comes from, not Isaiah Saldivar. And sadly, there's a lot of ministers that are right now in adultery and sexual sin and perversion, and they still cast out demons. Go read the book of Matthew. They'll be, stand before the Lord and say, we prophesy, we did miracles, and God will say, depart from me, I never knew you. So that shows me it's possible to be out of relationship and still do the works and the miracles. And if you are a genuine believer and there might be a demon there you're struggling with or fighting or you don't know if it's gone or not, don't let it hinder you. If you know you need deliverance and you know there's a demon, I recommend get deliverance first. I tell people, if you know a demon's there, get deliverance before you start praying for other people. And then once you're free, it'll be much easier because what will happen is sometimes, I don't want to scare you, you'll start doing deliverance on the person and then you start manifesting. So you don't want to be manifesting while you're trying to lead deliverance. Um, but in the case of you might not know if something's there, don't wait until you're this perfect Christian before, because guess what? You'll never start doing deliverance. I have couples come to me like, we want to have kids, but we want to wait till we're through med school. We have to do 12 years of law school. I'm like, if you're waiting till you're ready to have kids, you're never going to have kids. Just have them and figure it out. Bring them with you. Put them in your backpack. My kids have never stopped me from doing anything. I'm like, I take them with me wherever I go. I travel with my kids. And I wasn't waiting like, let me wait until I'm ready till God does 100 conferences. No, I got married literally a week later from my... I left my honeymoon directly to a conference, started having kids, brought them with me to every event, and it is what it is. They come with me. If we stay up late, my kids are up late. If they wake up early, my kids wake up early. I'm not going to let that hinder me from doing what God called me to do, so don't let having a demon hinder you from doing deliverance. And I know it's controversial. Some of you won't agree. We don't have to agree on everything. Yeah, and I would like to bring just a little bit more clarity to one thing that he said here. I don't know if you noticed. But he said, don't let something that you may not be aware of yes. prevent you. If you're an unrepented sin, yes. like you're addicted to porn and you're not going to stop. If, you are a, if, if, if you've got a sin issue and you're unwilling to stop it, yeah, you don't need to be do doing not deliverance. Do deliverance. You may not even be saved. Yeah. Preach. So like, like salvation is repentance. So if you've got known stuff in your life, and you're disqualifying, well, we've got all of these other evangelists that are not saved and doing stuff. You know, first of all, God's not honoring the evangelist. He's honoring the person that came in faith. Yep. Yep. God will work around an unsaved evangelist on, in order to honor the faith that came to touch the hem of the garment of Jesus. So don't ever think that your sin can be excused, not only for ministry, but even for salvation. So good. You're in a very dangerous spot if you say, I am covered by grace, all while aggressively looking at sexual pornography or whatever the sin might be. So there were two differences I'm glad that you he clarified, clarified that. There. Yeah, it's only if you're unaware, for sure. I'm yeah, glad you unaware that. stuff, I don't know if we'll all, at any point, be aware of everything that's going on, but if your heart is good, and you know there's some things there, but you're not sure what they are. Holy Spirit hasn't shown them to you yet. You can minister. But if you're aware of it, Holy Spirit has shown you, and you're unwilling to repent, you don't need to be laying a hand on anybody. 
Yeah, that's so good. I, I, I used to have in my notes of my teaching, which I need to re-add it, is if you're not walking in a holy lifestyle, don't even start doing deliverance. Like, you should not be trying to do deliverance if you're walking in sin and you're living unholy and you're living unrighteous. This is for those that are walking in holiness, serving the Lord. Otherwise, you shouldn't even be dabbling, trying to cast demons out. You need to get your delivered yourself first before you start trying to do that. So I'm glad you clarified. Which kind of leads us to another question, not on the list, but I want you to talk into this. I've heard you talk into it. Uh, talk about the importance of this style of ministry, which this is for, this is for the army. Yeah. Um, this is not for the passive nominal, especially lukewarm Christian. Yeah. Um, but talk about the importance of separating from the secular if you're going to do this type of ministry and the, and, and the role that the secular often plays on compromise. Yeah, so I, would t I tell people this all the time. It's hard to cast out something you're entertained by. So when we go into deliverance and we're trying to cast out demons, yet all week long we've been entertained by them, um, Jesus said the ruler of this world, which is the devil, is coming but he has nothing in me. What gave Jesus, of course, he's God, so that helps, but what gave him incredible power and authority over these unclean spirits is him and the spirits had nothing in common. What he was saying was, there's nothing in me like you. There's no darkness or shifting shadow in me. I'm completely in light. I'm completely walking in the perfect will of God. Jesus never sinned, although he was tempted in every regard. So when you want to walk in that authority and in deliverance, you got to make sure you're separating yourself. So there might be movies. Hey, look, everybody else is going to see. That's fine. But I'm set apart. So I can go see it. What do you mean you can't? I'm, I'm, I've given my body to God, Romans 12. I've already dedicated my eyes to God, my hands to God, my feet to God. Everybody else in the church is doing it, but I'm a deliverance minister. I'm set apart. Here's what Paul said. He said, there's two types of vessels. There's golden vessels and there's wooden vessels. My grandma growing up had, now I don't even think these exist, but it was like a china hutch where it was a cabinet where you had all the special china ware um, dishes, spoons, and she had a gravy bowl, which I don't even know if those are a thing anymore, and, and golden spoons and all this. And I used to, as a kid, admire this china hutch. I'm like, look at all this beautiful stuff. I would ask, can we use it? Nope, you can't use it. Only during one time per year during Thanksgiving, my grandma, for a special occasion, would take all the Chinese ware out and then all this gravy bowl and we got to use it. It was very special as kids. This is what Paul is saying. There's wooden vessels, the Bible says, that are used for everyday things, and there's golden vessels for God's special purposes. Paul says, if you set your life apart, you will be a golden instrument for God. And when God says, I want to do something special, he uses the set-apart people. When God says, I want to do something average, he uses the average believers. Hey, I want to be set apart for God's use and God's glory. And when God says, I want to deliver that guy, who am I going to use? Oh, I'm going to use Isaiah because he's not watching what everybody else is watching. He's not listening to what everybody else is listening to. He's not going where everybody else is going. He's holy. He's set apart. So you really do have to choose how far you want to go. And if you want to be a wooden vessel, that's fine. You can be what you want to be. I'm not going to judge you about it. Just come to church, fill a chair. You'll probably still go to heaven and be saved, but I want a great reward on judgment day. The Bible says the righteous will be bold on judgment day. I want to run up to the gates. And you know, the Bible says, if you do God's will, you'll have a grand entrance at the first kingdom. I want there to be a grand entrance. I don't want them to be like, Isaiah is here. Open the gates. You know, it's like, I want them to be celebration. Isaiah is here. Look at this. Look at all the people Isaiah got to lead to the Lord. So let's live lives that are walking in holiness. Let's have nothing in common with darkness. I don't allow in my house, and you guys don't have to agree with me. It's fine. Anything that has to do with magic, witchcraft spells. If there is a Disney, demon Disney, wait, demon movie, Disney movie. If there is any movie, people are like, you don't go to Disneyland? No, I don't go to Transline. If there's any movie that has to do with, hear me, witchcraft, I don't allow it. So... My kids all know this is so funny because they're always like, um, Daddy, there's magic on the TV. And it's always like super innocent kid show. But it's like, to me, it's not because I don't want my kids to think magic is normal. You raise your kids watching demonic cartoons and these princess magic stuff and they're killing each other with magic, they're going to be 16 years old and be like, oh, I was raised learning about magic, so what's wrong with getting a reading at the mall, getting a tarot card reading? It's no big deal. So I want my kids to know we don't do magic, we don't do witchcraft, we don't do any of that. It doesn't matter if it looks innocent, we're turning it off, and so all of it. My kids, you know, a lot of these kids shows have yoga now, so my kids are always like, they're doing yoga! Ah! My kids are screaming like, Coco Melon's doing yoga! And they get all freaked out, so I want that to be in my house where we just don't do it because we just have, in this house, we have nothing in common with darkness. So we're very careful about the stuff like that. You know, it reminds me of, um, you know, when the disciples couldn't cast out a demon. Yes. They asked Jesus a wonderful question. They didn't ask, why did God not? They said, why could we not? Yes. And Jesus pointed them to two, two things 
fasting and prayer. Yep. This kind only go out by fasting and prayer, which he had already indicated that the problem was you're too perverse and you're ungodly. Yes. You're too close to the world and you're not close enough to God. And if you're too close to the world and not close enough to God, these demons are going to look at you and laugh. So in which they did. And he says, hey, you want to cast out these kind? Because he said these kind. Yes, you want to cast time, out these kind? Yep. Fast and pray. Yep. Get yourself away from the world. Get yourself close to God. And God's going to use you as that golden And when brother. you start doing deliverance ministry, dude, you're going to be so busy. You won't even have time for Fortnite. You're going to be like, I don't have time to play video games all night. I'm so busy doing deliverance at the local church, at the prayer meeting, ministering to my friends. So nobody's bored in deliverance. No one's like, when are we going to go play Xbox after? It's like, dude, everybody, you're locked in. It's God. So bu busy yourself up with the things of God. And you'll have no more Fortnite, time. Sonya. Yeah. No, it's all fine, right. it's fine. I was all just right. saying any Praise game, God. but you can play Fortnite. It's all good. It's not demonic. Sonya's got a real Fortnite problem. We're working on it with her. Right. I don't even know what games are popular. I don't even think Fortnite is popular. She doesn't anymore. even know what Fortnite is. Sonya, you know what Fortnite is? I'm she like, now I feel know. bad. I'm not even looking. I'm like, I didn't she know she was know. top ranked over here. She doesn't even know. All right, so, hey, this is a great question. Um, and I know that, you know, you can include everything in your training and obviously these questions, but talk about a little bit about emphasizing the importance of saturating yourself with the word of God and the, the part that the word of God actually plays in deliverance, not just speaking your words, but speaking God's words into the situation. Yeah, super simple answer to that. I mean, I think about the devil is probably the most powerful demon. And a lot of times demons will say, I'm Satan. And they're not Satan. They're saying, I'm Satan because they represent him. Just like we say, I come in Jesus' name. I'm not Jesus, but I represent him. That's why demons say they're Satan. Just a little uh, free nugget there. But when I, when I look at the devil and say, how would you fight the devil? I mean, this guy's like the guy that got thrown down and cast all loose for a fallen star. Like, this is the guy. This is the top dog. Jesus fought him. And how did Jesus fight him? It wasn't some mystical spiritual power. It was the word of God. Jesus said, it is written and quoted scripture. That's crazy to disarm the devil himself. So the problem with this generation is they don't know what's written. So you can't say it is written when you're fighting a demon, but you don't even know what's written. And you don't have time to Google, because a lot of people are like, Google says. I mean, a lot of us, including myself, we don't even know where anything's at. We just Google, where is this at? And I do that all the time, but it's like, David did not say, I've Googled your word, so I might not sin against you. He said, I've hidden your word in my heart. So we can just have a Google relationship with God. We do need to get in the word. And if anything, today I started with like some verses on purpose just because these are some textbook verses we should memorize when doing deliverance. So for example, when there's a stubborn demon saying, I have more power and authority over you, I'll quote like Matthew 10 or Luke 10. No, Jesus gave me authority over every serpent, every scorpion, and all the power of the enemy. He gave me authority as a disciple over demons. I'll just quote a scripture. And that gives you great power over demons. So you definitely want to make sure you have a relationship with God's word. Now we don't worship the Bible. I, I made a video about this and people got so mad I got canceled. I've gotten canceled like 40 times. Here I am. But I made a video about we don't pray to the Bible. And people went nuts. All the reform guys are like, what do you mean we don't pray to the Bible? I'm like, have you been praying to the Bible? <laughs> I'm like, no. We pray to the Father in Jesus' name through the power of the Holy Spirit. But we're not praying scripture. We're not worshiping our Bibles. The word of God is his word, and it's a light into our path and a lamp in our feet. But it's not God. Jesus is God. Well, what about G the word was and the word became flesh? Yes, Jesus. The Bi it was not talking about the Bible. It was talking about God's word becoming flesh, which was Jesus, the perfect manifestation of the word and will of God. So the Bible has incredible power, but we also want to make sure that we're not Father, Son, Holy Scripture, that we're Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Because a lot of people worship the Bible and the Bible becomes their God. And if the Lord speaks to them, they're like, nope, nope, I don't believe God speaks. I'm only Bible. So we also want to make sure that we're using the word appropriately and it doesn't become our God where we worship it and stuff like that, which that's another story. You definitely need to have the Bible. Have a relationship. Just don't bow down and pray to the actual literal Bible. Make sure you're, you're praying to the Lord, <laughs> which for some of you, that might be news. You're like, wow, I didn't know that. That's good. Praise That's Lord. good. Um, this, this question is centered around, all right, we've been going. We've been doing a deliverance session. Is it ever okay to push pause, to come back? Uh, we know that there's times where we need to, you know, like you said earlier, that demon's waiting for you to give up yeah. and just being sensitive to the Holy Spirit, knowing, hey, when can we push pause, come back 
uh, when do we need to keep going? That's really good. So I would say a good time to take a break is one, if the person's too exhausted to continue, they're just bodies torn where they're just physically can't keep going. The prayer team is getting weary, tired, and they just can't keep going effectively. And I like to take a break and you 1000% could stop in the middle and then schedule it for another day, 100%. If the person's not ready, of course, you should stop and then say, hey, I think you should fast or pray for a week. I don't, think, I don't feel you're ready, no offense to you, but I think you need to take some time to make sure those doors are closed, make sure you're living right, all of that. But the best time to pause, in my opinion, is right after a demon has left. So right when you hear that, ah, and then it's like, okay, there's relief, and then you're going on to the next demon, which you, what, some of this won't make sense till you do deliverance, but all of you deliverance ministers are like, you, you know, if you know, you know. That's when I like to take a break because Number one, I'm more stubborn than the demons. I'm like, I'm going to be more stubborn than you. So if a demon's manifesting, I'm, I'm, you're not going to wait me. Out. You're not going to wait me out. I'll, I'll cancel my meeting. I'll cancel my live stream. We're getting you out because you're making me mad now. So I don't like pausing while a demon's manifesting, specifically after we fought it for a while. Like if you've gone against that demon for 30 minutes, we're not, t- we're not stopping. We're going to get this thing out, and then when that stubborn demon's out, we could take a break and come back. But I want to make sure that if we're currently fighting a specific demon. We deal with it first so that it doesn't think it's one or it's outlasting us or it's stronger. So every case is different. You got to use discretion. You got to, but, but don't be one of those that's like, I'm so spiritual that I'm going to miss work and all everything and get fired from my job because I have to finish this one deliverance. No, you can stop. Hey, we ran out of time. Let's do another session. And you'll find the deliverance team comes back with more energy. The person comes back refueled and with more energy and it works out. But if the Lord tells you, no, with this person, you got to finish it. And the Lord's told me that before. Like, no, this girl, you got to finish it now. She won't come back. This has to be done right here. And I'll go, you know, two hours, three hours if I have to. So it's all about being led by the Spirit. Don't use this as an excuse to just stop the deliverance. Let the Spirit lead you, but don't be religious thinking, if I stop now, it, it can't continue because it can. You can definitely pause and come back and finish it up. That's cool. All right, this is not a question, but I just thought of this because I, I think practically. I've got a friend, uh, you've got a friend. We've identified that this is a demonic issue. We know deliverance needs to take place. I'm setting up my first deliverance session. Do I invite them to my house? Do we go to a public place, to a park? You know, what, what, what do you think is an ideal setting? Because one of the questions was, I've been told not to ever do deliverance in my house. Yeah. Because what if the demon gets loose and, you know, it's in my house now? You know, there's, there's things like, like that. So I've got a friend, I've got a coworker, I've got a family member that needs deliverance. How would you suggest that we set that up and we, we facilitate it? Yeah, so your house is a great place. Honestly, I recommend wherever they're most comfortable because that's where the deliverance is going to be the Maybe most Maybe go to smooth. their house? Yeah, or their house. If they're uncomfortable, the deliverance is going to be super hard. If they're going like this, like like uncomfortable with who's in the meeting, who's there praying. I let people know this is going to be there. Are you comfortable with that? A lot of people don't want their spouse there, rightfully so. So I'm like, do not bring your husband because if your husband's there, you're not going to divulge information. You're not going to let these things manifest. So whatever makes them most comfortable will be effective. I do not have no problem bringing them to my studio or bringing them to my house. In fact, my studio where I did my podcast was the main place I did deliverances for a long time. And I'll tell you, you can sleep peacefully there. You won't feel no demons. The idea that a demon jumps out of one person and plays leapfrog and jumps into another person is not scriptural and is is a thing the devil's made to prevent us from doing deliverance because if you believe that a demon's going to jump out of you onto someone else you're not going to do deliverance in the church because you're like dude we have all these innocent kids here and family so what happens the devil has now gotten you to no longer do deliverance in the church no longer do deliverance at your house so then where are you going to do deliverance guess where nowhere and that's the devil's favorite thing so this idea of demons jumping out it's not biblical jesus did deliverance in public he did deliverance in crowds Nowhere does the Bible say a demon will jump out and leapfrog. Now, let me say this. What, you pro- what probably happened was, let's say you do deliverance at your house, okay? And your cousin Jessica's there and your uncle Tony's there, whatever. You have your prayer team there and you're going to do deliverance on your friend. And your friend comes over and you do deliverance and your friend gets delivered. And then all of a sudden, uncle Tony's in the other room and now he's like manifesting, right? And he's screaming. And you're like, the demon jumped out of her into uncle Tony. No. Uncle Tony's demons got triggered. That's what happened. He already had demons, and the deliverance triggered the demons in the room. That happens all the time. We think the demon jumps out. No, it's just he had demons that weren't dealt with, and they got freaked out because they just saw their friend getting kicked out of its house, and they probably think, we're next. So they start screaming and panicking. 
That happens all the time. You did not get a demon from that girl, from Jessica. You just need to get delivered. So that's what happens. And people think it's jumping. It's all over the room. It's jumping out. No, no, no. We're, if you're doing it right, you're commanding them to go into the abyss. And once they go to the abyss, they're out of circulation. So you don't have to worry about demons playing leapfrogs. I would add to that, if you do go to someone's house, uh, just be mindful of being safe. Yes. If you don't know this individual, yes. bring somebody with you. If you've never been to that house, uh, you know, the, the enemy's constantly trying to, yes. um, to attack people who want to do this type of ministry. Don't be fearful, but be safe. Uh, deliverance and partnerships is a, is a really good thing. And obviously, someone of the opposite sex, be very mindful of those boundaries that he spoke about earlier. Yeah, and if they say, oh, you can do it at my house, but you know, I'm only 17 and my family, no, we're not going to your house to do deliverance and your family freak out and kick us out and then call the cops. If, they, if, they're, if you're not welcome there by the person that owns the house, do not do deliverance there because then that's the whole thing about spiritual jurisdiction and all that I don't want to go into. But my point is be somewhere where it's open and you're, they're allowing you and it's not like, well, my wife doesn't believe in it. She doesn't want you to come, but just come anyway. It's like, that's called rebellion. We're not doing that. Yeah, very good. Yeah, it's October, so obviously tis the season for Halloween questions. Oh. Uh, and uh, All these questions are going great. Autism, Halloween, let's go. Yeah, I mean, we're just going to be real. Uh, you know, uh, the, the question was pretty much, I'm paraphrasing, but is there any safe limit uh, to costumes and trick-or-treating and that kind of stuff? Or is your advice, um, why in the world would you even dabble? Yeah, so my advice is, why in the world would you even dabble? It's the, the, the holiday is this. Now, people are like, what about Christmas? What about Valentine's Day? Let's just think about Halloween. It's the only holiday that celebrates death demons, witchcraft, and warlocks. So that's like everybody knows that. The world knows that. You go to Home Depot and everything's witches, ghouls, warlocks. Like everywhere is decorated. So I, I personally wouldn't partake in that at any capacity. Even like, and I hope, I don't know if you guys do it here, so I'm sorry if I'm stepping on toes, but a lot of churches in my area do the trunk or treat. They're like, well, we're going to have our kids dress up and do Halloween, but it's safe environment. I just personally am like, I wouldn't even let my kids dress up as Bob the Tomato or Larry the Cucumber. I'm like, I don't even want them dressing up as VeggieTale characters because it represents dressing up for the dead. They used to dress up to disguise themselves from the demons. It's a whole pagan thing, and I just don't even want to be around it or near it. Well, my kids, what, they're going to miss out on candy. Um, let me just let you know. You can go buy them candy whenever you want. So I literally, my kids, we go to the store and buy them candy, go to the dollar store down the street from my house. They get candy all the time. They don't need it on Halloween. I already pay so much at the dentist anyway. I don't need them having buckets of Halloween for months. So this is the thing. Parents, I get it. I know the pressure. I could fill it in the room. I just don't want my kids to miss out. I do. I do. I want them to miss out. Like, you don't let your kids go to parties and dances. No, I want them to miss out on depression, on anxiety, on fear, on suicide, on demons. Like I want my kids to miss out on everything the world has to offer them and I want them to have everything God wants. So now let me say this last thing and you don't have to agree with me on this. If your church is doing, I know a lot of people call it like a harvest night and there's no dressing up and it's a night of games and fun and candy. I personally don't, I wouldn't sit there and leave the church over it. I know some people are like, I'm leaving my church, they're doing a thing. I personally wouldn't leave the church over it. If your church feels to do that, that's totally fine. I just draw the line on the dressing up, the pagan rituals and all that, the carving pumpkins. That's where I draw the line, but it's, it's not a salvation issue. You're not gonna go to hell. Your pastor's not gonna go to hell if he has trunk or treat. You're not gonna go to hell. I just personally would never celebrate or invite darkness in. And I just, I'm like, hey, what I do with my kids, like, hey, let's hang out, let's watch a movie, let's have fun, let's set a day apart. What do you guys wanna do tonight? And we make it a special day where we have way more fun than the world has and that's what it is. So, And we put a sign on our door like, the only ghost that lives here in the Holy Ghost, knock if you need prayer. So if you need prayer, you can knock. And I saw that online one year and I put it up and thought, hey, we're gonna give them prayer and they can knock on the door and Come we'll on. pray for them. Prayer so, and M&Ms. Yeah. Let's now go. we live out in the country, so thankfully no one comes by except for wild dogs. But yeah, there's that. Praise the Lord. If you're a pastor in the room, I know we got several pastors here today. Um, we used to do a trunk or treat. Um, and when we actually discovered that there were demons and things like that, we stopped for this main purpose. We didn't even want to do a harvest festival. I just didn't want to confuse anyone. Yeah. Yeah. And, and sometimes you can confuse people. Well, my pastor does this thing and I know he's spirit filled and I know we do deliverance and we do this thing at Halloween because they can actually misinterpret the whole event. So I just didn't want there to be any confusion. Like, hey, we're not going to participate. We actually commonly do worship nights, you know, on that night. 
Um, so, you know, pastorally, just be thinking about do whatever it takes not to confuse people into believing that something's acceptable that can actually be rather dangerous. And I've had really. a lot of ex-witches and warlocks, according like, uh, and guys like John Damaris on my show, and every single one of them say the same thing. Do not celebrate Halloween. It's the day of witchcraft. It's the day where the veil is the smallest. It's the day where witches and warlocks are doing all their incantations, all their Black Sabbath, all their spells. And so if they're telling me not to do it, they say it's their favorite day. So I'm like, the favorite day of a witch should be my least favorite day. You should not say have a witch saying it's my favorite day, and it's also your favorite day. So, yeah. I know a lot of Christians are like, I love Halloween. It's my favorite time of year. I'm like, uh, says witches. We don't want to do that. By the way, witches and people of Satan who have been fasting and praying. Yes. Like yeah. they've been preparing for this event that you're going to, and odds are you haven't been. Yeah. And so, I mean, they're, they're, doing, they're doing a whole, in the same way that we pray and fast for Easter to see people saved, yeah. they pray and fast for Halloween to see people taken. Yeah. And your children aren't probably spiritually ready for what these people have been putting into the atmosphere. So I would want to keep them in my house that night and under my covering. Yep. And, you know, again, we want to prote protect the most vulnerable. Um, I mean, I, I've read things, and I'm sure you have as well, as people of demonic uh, sources that actually pray spells over the candy that yep. they pass out, expecting to take advantage of the most vulnerable, which are children. So there's just a lot going on that night. Don't be crazy. You know, don't, 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 don't fear Your man. kids will survive. They're Listen, gonna make it. Let them dress up the next day. They're like, yeah, you can wear it. My kids love dressing up in little outfits. Dress up in an outfit, but you're not dressing up like on Halloween and doing the pagan rituals and all that. But kids love playing dress up. It's just not the right night. <laughs> yeah. Yep, 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 yep. All right. Well, we've got that one. All right. Um, talk about a little and bit about. And don't let them dress up as demons, but go ahead. You know, I, we've heard we've heard mixed uh, we've heard mixed advice about praying in tongues, speaking in tongues while doing deliverance. Um, you know, what is what is your advice there as okay. far as yeah? You know, just should I speak in English? Should I speak in the language? Should I pray in tongues? What's going on? Really good. So I will sometimes have somebody low under their breath praying in the spirit, asking the Lord for words of knowledge. And they will give me the words of knowledge that the Lord's showing them, but I will not have somebody praying loudly in tongues, just diverting the deliverance and causing a distraction. Because we already know the demons don't understand the tongues. Your tongues is edify yourself and to pray for yourself, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14. So it's not very fruitful to be praying tongues over somebody in deliverance because the demons don't understand. And you're trying to get them to understand that they have to leave. So if you're like, robo -tubo and you're praying in tongues, the demon's like, I have no clue what you're saying. I'm just going to chill. <laughs> I mean, really, they don't have to go. So you want to use English when you're commanding. It's not, it's, it is okay to have somebody like on the side praying in tongues, getting words of knowledge, getting information. Or here's another circumstance where I would pray in tongues. If it's stalled out, if I don't know what to do next and I need a word of knowledge or I need God's help, guess what Isaiah will do? I'll start on my own, not for the person, I'll start praying in the spirit, allowing God to pray through me so I can get some type of download, some type of information or some type of breakthrough. But I'm not praying for them and I'm not praying for them to be delivered when I'm praying in tongues. I'm doing what Paul said. I'm speaking to God. Nobody understands me and I'm edifying myself, trying to ask the Lord, I need help. <laughs> That's what I'm doing. If you hear me praying in tongues and deliverance, God help. I don't know what's going on here. Why won't they leave? Or if my prayer team is, they're getting information from me and they're doing it low, but they're not distracting they're not diverting. I go to some churches where they're screaming in tongues or the person, fire, fire, screaming in tongues. And the demons, <laughs> but the demon's just being tortured. It's not going anywhere. I'm like, hey guys, I love the passion, the zeal. You've seen me preach. I love shouting. I, it's fun for me. But that's not going to get the demon out. We got to be direct. We got to be stern and we got to command because they're actually waiting for your command in, with your authority of Christ. And you got to be specific. You can't yeah. just scream and speak in tongues. So I, I don't want to offend anybody. I hope I'm not stepping on no one's toes, offending anybody, quenching your spirit. That's just personally what I found to be effective and what I found to be biblical. The only time tongues is beneficial to other people is if you're speaking a message in tongues, which in that case, Paul says we need an interpreter. If you're praying in tongues, 1 Corinthians 14, you don't need an interpreter because you're only edifying yourself. So That's I hope good. that brings some clarity. It does. It does. And it's helpful. I know that sometimes in corporate settings, you'll see somebody being prayed for. They begin to manifest a demon. Your first response as a Christian is to go yeah. help. Yeah. I want to go help. And sometimes people run up and, and, and I understand your passion for trying to help the person, but often that just brings more chaos yeah. Yeah. into an already chaotic situation. So just be mindful when you're trying to help. One of the things that you can do is step back, pray in tongues silently, or begin to listen and and dialogue with the Lord and bring information 
um, to the minister when appropriate. You know, don't go in and interrupt, but you listen, write some things down. Those are the best ways to be helpful. Yeah, people will tell me one lady pushed back and said, well, I'm speaking in tongues and the devil doesn't understand it. I'm like, yes, we want him to understand right now what we're telling him to do. You're gonna, it's like telling your kid go clean the room, but doing it in a language they don't understand. The kid's like, you're mad I didn't clean my room, but I don't even know what you're saying. Well, you should know. No, I don't know, because you got to speak English. So we're trying to tell the demon to leave, and it's, they don't understand tongues. So her, her reason why she should pray in tongues was the demon to understand, but her very reason was the reason why she shouldn't. So I hope that makes sense. I'm like, yeah, that's why I'm telling you not to pray in tongues, is because they don't understand you. She's like, oh, yeah, that makes sense now. All right, so um, one of the last questions here. Um, talk about some of the most stubborn demons, you know, things that we might want to be mindful of that, that like, I think you've already mentioned, like the spirit of religion, which yeah. is often hidden. It's often deeply rooted in us. We don't even know it's there. But what, what are some of the most difficult demons that you've encountered and maybe barriers that, you know, we can overcome when we encounter those? Really good question. So to speak on the spirit of religion, I was a part of a church. They were letting me use one of their buildings for a couple of years. And the pastor was like, Christians cannot have demons. Deliverance is not for the church. Meanwhile, everyone was getting delivered in this church through our ministry, but that's a whole nother story. Um, he didn't believe in Christians having demons. So one day we were doing deliverance on somebody that was one of the leaders at the church that came to us for deliverance. And the demon of religion manifested and literally spoke out, this is just a funny story, and was like, I'm also in the pastor. <laughs> the demon of religion like, I'm in the pastor too. I was like, oh, I already knew that but it was just a funny point that literally his spirit of religion was stopping him from believing that Christians need deliverance and not allowing God to move and still friends on this day we honorably left there because I was causing I literally came to him he didn't kick me out I came to him saying I think I'm causing too much division because we disagree so heavily on this topic and I don't want to cause division in your church right and I was a part of the church preaching there but also using the building he knew my stance I knew his stance I just felt it was best if we parted ways because I didn't want to bring division right division is division that's too two visions and I didn't want to bring another vision to his house and so I told him I said bro I love you you love me I think you should just bless me out because I don't want to be I don't want to be unhonorable and it's just causing anyways that happened so yes spirit of religion is strong but the number one thing that's so hard to deal with is always witchcraft and specifically when dealing with people it's it's one thing to unknowingly open yourself up to demons, right? So say you're a Christian and you're watching porn and you don't even really know much about demons or spiritual warfare and now you get a spirit of lust, but you didn't really like know you were invoking this thing. You just kind of opened the door and it came in. That's not too hard to deal with. When you have people that I deal with often that have been years in the occult, years like a John Ramirez, years opening the door, and they're inviting the demon. It's one thing to open the door. It's another thing to invite and be like, come on in, come on in. Like you're yelling for them. Those people are very hard to do deliverance on. I already know it's gonna be, you know, eight hours minimum for most sessions. It's gonna be rough because there's something about using your free will to say, I want you in my life. Just like with God, right? There's power in you saying, God, I want you. There's Christians that are like, yeah, God, you're cool. And they live a normal life and they probably go to heaven. There's other Christians like us that are here going, Lord, I want more of you. Fill me with your spirit. There's another level. You guys see the difference? So when you're doing deliverance on normal people that are just like, yeah, I sinned once in a while and a demon came in, as opposed to people that are in the occult where they're living their whole life about inviting these things, doing sacrifice, doing rituals, doing new age, doing yoga, teaching yoga. So I have a lot of friends that are now saved that were like that. Those men are always, I already, I've never had one that is easy. It's always hard because for whatever reason, the demon knows like, no, you told me to come. So I'm staying. I'm not going. You invited me. So that open invitation, which is usually involved in the occult and witchcraft, those are going to be the hardest. And in that case, um, if you're new, you probably should get help. You should probably, because you're going to get discouraged. If your first deliverance is somebody that came out of new age or occultism, you may get discouraged, but it's, but it's normal for it to take that long. Let me just say, because of the lifestyle they came out through, ritual abuse, all of that is very intense, and those are the hardest. All the other stuff is not as bad. It's always I come to find that there's always these ancient crazy demons that have been invited in, and that's when you start getting into them being in a relationship with the demon and them worshiping the demon and building altars. It just becomes very deep, very dark, and becomes hard you have to really fight for them and and like what john went through and I've other friends i've had on the podcast that have gone through lots of deliverance i've taken some of them through it's like session after session i'm like i don't ever want to see you again i mean it's like every week we're doing deliverance um but it's just part of you spending years inviting them in you yeah. just have to deal with it 
So the people who have made coasts, yes. covenants and yep. oaths. Signed the contracts, yeah. which I, I do want to really quickly speak through because you will deal with a lot of people that say, I signed my soul to the devil. The devil cannot buy your soul. There, there's actually no such thing as selling your soul to the devil. What happens is the devil convinces you you've sold your soul. The book of Ezekiel says all souls belong to God. So your soul does not belong to you. If I don't have something, I can't sell what doesn't belong to me. But people will actually think they sold their soul and they'll think they're unredeemable and unsavable and undeliverable. It's a lie. I always tell people, you didn't sell your soul. I know a demon came to you telling you you did. I could assure you that you did not sell it. It does not belong to you. You can still be saved. I know many people right now that are saved that sold their soul to the devil when in reality it was just a deception. So if you deal with those people, assure them you didn't sell your soul. It was a deception. God can redeem you. The devil does not own anything. I literally believe the devil owns nothing. Like there's nothing on the world that the devil owns. It all belongs to God. He rules it and governs it, but it doesn't belong to him. And so I teach people, the devil, name one thing the devil owns. I'll wait. It's quiet. Yeah, the devil doesn't own anything. So he can't be buying souls and out there. He's not, you know, willing and dealing auction house people's souls. It's just a deception. God owns a soul. Sweet. Have you enjoyed this? Say yes. yes. Super helpful. All right, one last question. And this is only going to be for a couple of people. But I want you to speak into this. For the person that gets really passionate about this, for the, peop for the people that, like, this, this is my primary mission. You know, I'm going to heal the sick. I'm going to lead people to Christ. But I think I've been anointed to cast out devils. For the person that gets really excited about this and then begins to um, do upper-level spiritual warfare, going and looking for principalities, uh, going and looking for darkness. You know, I've heard some people say, uh, you know, um, my, our responsibility is to follow Christ, not go looking for the devil. Yeah. But if a devil steps in my way, I know what to do with it. So all of the you know people that are looking for principalities over cities and trying to find the high places to go tear them down, what would you say to those folks? Okay, so that's a whole other teaching that's really good about challenging principalities. I've been taught, and some of my mentors that have done 10,000, and the guy told you 50,000, they've all told me, do not go into the second heaven trying to fight principalities. And this is why, that's not where your jurisdiction is. You've been given power and authority to cast out demons from people, not to go up. Paul never went up into Rome and said, I'm going to go up into the Roman Empire and cast out. You never ever see Paul trying to go up into the second heaven and astral project and fight principalities. So you could get, you could do that, but it gets very dangerous. And I could name story after story of people who did that and their life fell apart because they were messing in territory that they were not called to mess in. One guy, specific story that a friend of mine told me was there was a, a, um, a intersection where always accidents, people were dying. This one intersection where people were dying all the time. So he was like, there must be a principality of death, which he was right. There was, he was like, there must be a principality of death over that intersection. I'm going to go up and bind that thing. So he went to the intersection and literally started praying, Lord, I'm going to go up right now. Bring me to the second heaven. And all of a sudden, as he's doing this, trying to challenge it, he's like, I challenge the principality of death. He starts getting physically choked to where he starts dying. He cannot breathe. He's getting killed by this thing. And all of a sudden, he's like, Ugh. and then he goes, Ugh, and gasps for air. And the Lord spoke to him clearly and said, I saved you that one time. Don't do it again. The Lord said, there is a principality of death. I did not give you authority over that demon. There was a demon there of death, a principality, and that's over freeways and all that. It's a whole nother deep thing. But the Lord literally told him, don't do it again. I protected you that one time. The next time I'm not protecting you like that. And there's story after story of people going to strip clubs and binding principalities. And then a week later, they're being demonized by all the spirits of lust you can imagine. I stay in the realm. I'm, I have jurisdiction, right? If I'm at the sheriff's department, I'm not going to go arrest people in the city. I'm going to stay in the county. If I'm a city PD, I'm not going into the county. There's already sheriffs out there. If I'm a city PD, I'm not on the highways. That's the California Highway Patrol. Stay in your jurisdiction. Stay where God's giving you authority. That's the place of protection and safety. Okay, so that's point one. I wouldn't go out looking for principalities. If the Lord shows you, okay, now if the Lord shows you there's a principality, I want you to pray. Daniel did pray in Daniel 10, and the Bible says angels came and fought the principality of Persia. Daniel did not fight them. The angels did. So you could pray. This is okay. Lord, if the Lord shows you, Lord, I ask you, Lord, would you send your angels to war against these things? God, would you send your angels to fight against any principalities in my city? I have nothing wrong with that. But I do have wrong with you going out being like, there's a principality over this bar. I'm going to go up into the second heaven, astral project, and I'm going to force my spirit out of my body. And people do do this. And I'm going to challenge that thing. You'll lose. Don't do it. It's not your jurisdiction. Worry about casting demons out of people. That will weaken them because they're the ones commanding lower-ranking demons, all that. And then, okay, last point is, because there was two questions of principality. The second one was, are we going out looking for demons? Yes. Yes. I had one pastor like, I don't, I don't think you should be going out looking for demons. Uh, Jesus sent the disciples out 
to go cast out demons. Jesus did not say, wait for them to come to our meeting. He said, go out in the highways and byways, preach the gospel, cast out demons, heal the sick, and cleanse the lepers. So yeah, we go out and we're looking for a fight. We're looking for people to do deliverance on. We're looking for people to preach to. Should we go out and pray for the sick? Yes. Should we go out and preach the gospel? Yes. So what's wrong with going out and doing deliverance? I think it's definitely essential if you put them all together and go do it. Uh, you should be looking around like somebody at the altar is manifesting. Pastor, can I help pray with you? Hey, I want to be involved in the deliverance teams. Yeah, you should be active. If you, if you feel special calling to deliverance ministry, like God is telling you this is your ministry, then yes, go out and look. Go out and be a part. Help us out. Do the work. Um, I don't see any problem with it. I think people that say that are people that just are lazy and they're waiting for it to come to their door. But news alert, Jesus never said stay. He said go. That's literally the Great Commission. Go and make disciples, not stay. So let, let's go. Let's go do it. Amen. Amen. What feeds a principality and gives it authority is the people in the area that are cooperating with it, the people that are in sin. If the church does, it jo does its job and leads people to Christ in a city, sets people free in a city, the principality naturally falls yes. or has to go somewhere else. So the way you bring a principality down is to not to go up to it and fight it or even pray against it per se. You get the intelligence to know what people are struggling with the most in the city. And now you know how to disciple them. Now you know how to minister to them. And then the principality, he's got to go somewhere else. We had a friend that was doing deliverance. Do you remember? I don't know if you remember this, Michael. And um, this is years ago. And he was in San Francisco doing deliverance on this guy. And he said, out of the guy came this massive demon, appeared as a per, like at, in form, a huge demon, and said, it was in San Francisco, said, I'm the principality of homosexuality, and drew a picture of San Francisco on the wall, and then had his sharp, nasty fingernail, wiped his fingernail across the whole city, and said, this is my throne, this is my city, leave. And he said, they literally felt, when that principality came out of that guy and started talking, he said, we felt like we were going to die. We literally got on our faces on the ground. And then he said, all of a sudden, that demon was standing there. And then he felt somebody in the back behind him walk in the room. And that principality screeched and ran out of the room. And he just said, they laid there on the ground like they were going to die. They said, they felt like if they moved at any moment, they were going to die. And he said, we didn't even talk about that. Weeks went by. And he said, dude, do you remember that? He said, yeah. And his friend said, oh, yeah, you're talking about when Jesus walked in the room and cast that, ran that principality right out of the room. He's like, that that, that, he said the, the spirit made us feel like we were going to die, but when Jesus came in the room, we literally felt like if we moved a muscle, we would die, and we couldn't move until he, Jesus left the room. But my whole point was this is like high levels, high devils. You don't want to get involved in trying to sit there and challenge these principalities. They're incredibly wicked. They're way more powerful than what we're dealing with in people. Principalities could live in people. It's very rare and uncommon. Most of the time, it's the principalities commanding lower-ranking demons, as Pastor just said. And so that's what we want to target. I would just personally just stay out of the second heaven and not worry about it. God gave me a vision many years ago of the second heaven. It was terrifying. It was demons torturing and tormenting people, throwing them off of cliffs, all these crazy things. And I had this open vision or out-of-body vision, and I was like, I don't ever want to see that again, go there again. It's very wicked what goes on in the heavenly realms. The Bible says the devil is the prince of the power of the air that he rules in the heavenly realms. If you think the devil's in hell, he is not in hell. He does not live in hell. There's nowhere in the Bible where it says hell is where he lives. Hell is his final destination, not his current address. So currently now the devil's ruling the world. He's ruling from the air and he's a very alive and active and more, and we need to be more alive and active and more in the church equipped to go do the work and why today is so important that we're getting equipped for this. Amen. Amen. It's a good close. It's a good word. Thank you so much. Well, hey, we want to pray for you like I promised, so this is how we're going to do it. I want you to very um, quickly, uh, don't worry about your stuff, just leave your stuff right where you're seated, but I want us to line the wall. For those of us that are joining online, this is your departure. Thank you so much for being with us, uh, and share this video with your friends, especially share it with your church friends that don't believe that this is for today and that demons can, can um, oppress the church. We would really like for you to share this, but thank you so much for being with us. For everybody in the room, I want you to take a position on the wall. Back to the wall. Let's just make a circle around the room, a semicircle. Don't come up to the stage. Just start over here at the sides. Put your back to the wall somewhere. Uh, and Isaiah's going to come around the room and just pray a quick blessing over you. Don't